conversation about adolescent pregnancy is one that we have played ostrich with. The public is outraged with current statistics, but it seems that very little is being done in the approach in the fight against the growing numbers. And if care is not taken, all attempts might fail. I'd say somebody I really like that I maybe want to go out with. I am caught up probably in a, in a dilemma. So our relationship is shaky right now because I'm not willing to give in sex. I've spoken to most of my friends and they're like, oh, you know what? Look, who even said um, whoever I'm going to marry wants to marry a virgin? That perhaps summarizes the challenges faced by the teenage girl today. And it will take a lot to mitigate the growing trend. The 2021 population and housing census says Ghana's population grew by some 6.1 million people over the last decade. More than 555,000 plus teenagers got pregnant between 2016 and 2020, according to the Ghana Health Service. That is a whooping 18% estimate of Ghana's population over the last five years and a year's worth of population growth in the past 10 years. It is clear that the teenage pregnancy phenomenon may worsen. But the question is, why are so many girls falling pregnant in their teens? You know, peers are able to discuss things that they can discuss with parents or things that they can discuss with their teachers. And after the discussions, they will want to experiment. And nowadays, we all know, I mean, what's, what's going on, that young people are such that um, certain things that they, 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 they are not supposed to, that is what they will want to. But what are the options in the face of scarce and fast depleting resources? Your guess is as good as mine. Meet 18-year-old Nuria, who fell pregnant at 16 and is now a mother to two-year-old Zuberu. Nuri applies her trade as a head porter at the Nima market. She moved to the capital to fend for her family. Nuria, who hails from Waliwali, says if given the chance, she would want to go back to school. One of the big risks girls like Nuria face in the big city is vulnerability. We are coming to a situation in some homes where people just feel that you just give birth and everything else is somebody else's responsibility. It cannot happen like that. You know, when you, you have a girl child especially, you need to pay special attention because of the uniqueness of the girl child. Because girls are so vulnerable to so many issues, even the, the way their body develops and everything, and the emotions that they go through during puberty is something that parents will need to take care of. According to the United Nations Children Fund, not only can early pregnancy and delivery during adolescence derail girls' healthy development into adulthood, but negatively impacts on their education, livelihoods and health. To every child, no matter where you are. 
That has been the impact on Nuria as well as Saida, whose story isn't much different. Saida fell pregnant when she was 15. Her eldest child, aged five, is in Waliwale in the Northeast region where she hails from, while her second child, barely a year old, born at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, resides permanently on her back. One of the biggest challenges teenage mothers face is rebuilding their lives, especially if they crave an education or formal work. Florence A.C. Corti, the acting director for the Department of Children, explains that providing the needed support is crucial but hampered by limited resources. We do not have enough allocations to target the numbers that we have. And then because we also are supported by donor partner, you know, a donor partner always have this quirk that they, they have to be looked at for, or I have a focus on this region, I have a focus on that region. And then you see that the critical place that you need to focus on is not there. And then two, um, yeah, which is related to funding all right, is the issue of, some, as you said, a case has been reported, a victim needs support or things like that. We don't have the funding for that. So what we are praying is that the domestic violence fund, there should be enough fund in that fund so that people who need support can assess it. Saida and Nuria married early as a result of their pregnancies and had to drop out of school. But it's not all teenage mothers who give up on education. There are those determined to get it. Not all teenage mothers give up totally on education. And that's just a minimal of all the cases recorded each year. That has been the inspirational story of Rita Awuni, a teenage mother whose photos with her son attending the same school but at night slept at the art center after school with her toddler became a national headline story. The 17-year-old story moved sections of the public and Vice President Dr. Mahmoud Bahumia intervened to provide support. Rita's story is a case study of the realities teenage mothers face when returning to school in a society that stigmatizes and judges. Then, there's the burden and practicality of combining academic work with motherhood. Often, one or the other suffers. Stigma, the biggest challenge of all. Culturally, there's a lot of stigma that is associated with this sort of thing. The challenge is that people are probably too embarrassed, they're too ashamed. You meet a young lady who says, look, I've been raped. She has actually reported this to the police. But she'll tell you that, oh, you know, as soon as it happened, I felt so uncomfortable, I felt so dirty, I took a shower. She has destroyed concrete evidence. Then you find that even forensics are a challenge. But when it comes to sexual assault, when it comes to defilement, those are actually even more unfortunate. Joyce Bar Mukhtari is a politician who is very vocal about teenage pregnancy issues. She is particularly concerned about the lack of education in schools, considering how sexually active teenagers are nowadays. When it is young children having sex amongst themselves, that is actually a bigger problem. And we are told that at least 11 to 15 percent fall within this category. So it is part of those who are in the senior high schools, largely, who are engaging in these activities. But remember that even in some of the junior high schools, which is an experience I found very interesting, there are young children, young girls, who are not even in senior high school yet, who are also engaging in very active sexual behavior. So where do we go from here? Do we just let it go on? Because, you know, we are very conservative as a society. 
and most people will frown upon a young child of say 16 being on public contraception or even adhering to some form of contraception. People would rather believe that the conversation around abstinence is what helps. Adolescent moms tend to lose out on their childhood and the intervention to get them back to school could be the only attempt at giving them their lives back. The Department of Children, an agency and an agenda ministry is consciously implementing a back-to-school program for these teenage girls, which, if widely implemented across Ghana, perhaps could be a game-changer. The real focus is about pregnancy prevention because it's been realized that it's key contribution to the absence of the girl child in school in adolescence. Barring that the child is not, the pregnancy is not able to be prevented, then the girl child is given the opportunity to come back and complete the education. At first, there was a lot of, I mean, resistance from headmistress thinking that it will encourage. It's been seen that when such cases happen, rather, it rather calms the girl down because then they are facing the reality of what can happen to them and the setup. And of course, in any situation, you will have recalcitrants who may say they will deny the child that this is so. Many such cases are reported. Then the, the child um, girls education unit and the guidance and counseling unit follow up and deal with it. But it's not just teenage mothers with challenges. In most of these conversations, it seems that the males are able to go scot-free, probably able to finish their education with no responsibilities towards the baby mama or baby's mother and their child as well. I met up with Usman Ibrahim, who epitomizes the story of teenage parenthood not often told. One time, I can't leave the Kent Street. Kent Street is no more than me. I can't no more than I've been through now. Almost come on eight months. So no more than I've been through now. The tough thing is that I'm going to get my son 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 to get my son. 17-year-old Usman lives on the streets of Nima. He dropped out of school to work to support his 16-year-old mother of his child. Seriously, it's still difficult. Allah. Come on, it's too late. I'm not going to get out of here. I'm 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 going to get out of here. Should Usman and his baby mother really be faulted. Family planning and teenagers seems an uncomfortable conversation. In a country where the age of sexual consent is 16, it is also almost surprising that people will think that there will be no teenage pregnancies. Hence the shock some months ago when Ghana's regional teenage pregnancy statistics were released. Topping the list is a Shanti region with 89,000 teenage pregnancies, followed by East Team, Central and Greater Accra regions. Interestingly, Northern region, where a high number of Kayayes come from, is at number 6, while Northeast and Savannah regions are 14th and 15th on the table. So, what is the way forward to reduce teenage pregnancy? Probably repackage our a teenage pregnancy message, we look at it and package it and look at who the target should be. Are we getting the message across very strongly or we are missing the target group? What extent of information are we ready to expose our children to in the homes and in schools? Very recently there was an issue about um, comprehensive sexual education and there was a backlash in the country. Our country said our children are not grown enough to have certain kinds of conversation. We drew back. Did we ever revise what it is that we wanted to table in our schools and went back to the schools and had the right conversation with our children? We talk about prevention, we talk about prosecution and punishment, and we talk about protection. So when I say prevent it, prevent the abuse, increase awareness, and even when you prosecute and sanction people, it stands in space for prevention. Joyce Baumukhtari agrees. There must be a certain national policy. There must be a certain intentional, strategic approach to it. Look, 
For those who want to go for contraception, we can start the conversation maybe at the senior high school level. But for the junior high school in particular, the emphasis must certainly be on abstinence. But you see, persecutions will always serve as a way of stopping it. They will deter other offenders. When you actually prosecute certain key persons in public, for example, the story that we heard about involving a certain traditional uh, chief or ruler somewhere, those are key figures that when you prosecute fully and you report fully, it will send a very clear message. I sat down with some young ladies, all virgins, who also shared their suggestions to reduce the canker of teenage pregnancy. The people you see around you is what will motivate you to do something. So if you go to our communities where the young people are not actually getting real role models to follow up, then I think that it now comes back to the men. If 34, 44, 50 years are actually sleeping with our young girls and giving excuses as insatiable as appetite for sex, it's very ridiculous. I think that punishment, first of all, we shouldn't just send them to jail. I, I really hate sending people to jail. <laughs> like, come on, they'll go and do it again. With the agenda setting power of the media and with the priming and with the framing, we can give much attention to educating teenage teenagers growing up so that they know the essence of keeping themselves and the dangers okay that's that's embedded in you know teenage pregnancy the parents too should also be able to talk to their children sit your child down have a conversation with them involve them because as a mom or a father if you don't involve your children and you don't talk to your children or you don't even address your children about relationship and other stuff they feel like oh my parents i can't talk to them they are too strict a lot of these people are raped. I have two friends who were raped, um, I mean, growing up. They're not, they're not over the, the trauma. And you speak to them and you feel this sadness. You, you feel it's coming from a very um, dark place. There's this deep-seated anger in them that they don't want to have anything to do with men. Again. Sexual reproductive health practitioner with PPAG, Abigail York, wants teenagers to practice safe sex. There are two evils. You either go into it, have sex, get pregnant, go through an abortion or delivery, or you use the family planning uh, method to prevent the pregnancy. You see, but uh, some of them think that once you have a partner and you start having sex with, with the person and they start using the condoms, once they 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 are they become um, partners. I mean, they can use the condom for some time and then at a point one time they will stop using the condom and that is where the danger lies. You either get pregnant or you, you contract an STI. Abstinence, though the preferred choice, isn't always easy in a society where sex is openly discussed and practiced. Abstinence is a choice. And it is only when the person is making an informed decision that the person can used to say that I will abstain because we always preach about abstinence but how well can we follow up on the children abstaining and we keep saying oh me bani akola boni no it's not akola no no ya akola boni but it is the kind of environment that the child finds itself in the kind of friends that the person has found himself in or the kind of uh, the peers and the information that they share that is sometimes shape them to that point keeping myself till marriage sometimes when i'm talking with my friends then they are like oh antoinette why won't you and i'm like please 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 you people have done it that is what you people want to do me i'm keeping myself and it's very very difficult because even your friends are even influencing you that oh you to do this like why are you keeping yourself you will die like it's very very difficult in my case right now i don't know what to do i know i like this person very much i've spoken to most of my friends and they're like oh you know what look who even said um whoever are going to marry wants to marry a virgin and so now it's conflicting it's between you your friend your god your boyfriend and i don't know what to do gender activist Diana Diko wants young men to receive more education about the impact of their behavior.
Have we had um, an advocacy system where we are targeted only young girls? And we have uh, probably even gone to the extent of encouraging virgin clubs, bringing young girls together into virgin clubs and saying that's a way of protecting themselves from any form of sexual engagement and almost putting the responsibility of safety on the shoulders of girls. And have we ignored the fact that we come from a culture setting where men are more sexually expressive than women. Over 2,300 girls were defiled. And when we say defiled, these are girls below the age of 16, were defiled in Ghana by men between 2019 and just 2020. Are we running a system where men feel entitled to women's bodies to the extent that they can go after them at any time, anywhere? And Joyce Baum, Tari Sikens. When you see the documentaries, for example, you see the girls parading the babies, you see the girls with the pregnancies. Have you ever seen any of these documentaries that have spoken to a teenage son or boy who has been made to be responsible for a young girl that he has impregnated before? No, it is actually the parents who take responsibility and the boy is allowed to continue with his education. Whereas on the other hand, the girl is not. So that also presents a certain social canker of young people who should actually be abstaining. But Florence Isikoti says the Gender Ministry has done a lot of education in that regard. Our mentorship program that we do for girls, we do involve boys. Because, I mean, it's two people, it takes two. It's not only one person. So we've now also gotten the boys involved. We've never said that the, the boy doesn't have responsibility. Because if you go to our man's homes, you see a lot of boys there who have been charged with um, rape and defilement as a result of this issue, thinking that they were having relationship with their girlfriends or things like that, and they have gotten them into problems. So we, we do focus on that when we meet them, but we say that it's your body. You decide what happens to your body. And of course, fathers are one of the groups that we are targeting now. That it's not only for the girl child alone. On average, over 100,000 avoidable adolescent pregnancies are recorded annually. There are multiple array of interventions that should be pursued, such as reviving consistent sexual reproductive health education campaign, strengthening internal family systems, and encouraging the efforts of both state and non-state actors to help teenage moms and stop the unending cyclical spiral of a future unplanned or destroyed due to pregnancy. So as we've all witnessed, there are many factors that contribute to the high rates of adolescent pregnancies. And more seriously, it's the effects it has on not only the individual, but the family, the society, and the nation as a whole and understanding the causes and effects of these teenage pregnancies are important in effectively reducing the high rates that the country has been recording over the years. Aisha Yakubu Khaled, TV3 News, Accra. Teenage pregnancy,